487th contact. Wednesday, February 3rd, 2010. Patar says, we carried out our latest count on the 31st of December, 2009, whereby it produced a total number of 7,831,814,138 for terrestrial humanity. Billy says in regard to that, it should first of all be said that your count deals with every single human being on the earth, consequently, therefore, also with those approximately 1,30s, 30s, 30s, 30s who are never recorded by the census because, in the big cities and places, they live on the streets and also underground in the cities of over a million but also as indigenous people, and so forth, in the wilderness as well as in jungles. That is no more taken into consideration with censuses than is the fact that even with official counts, not all human beings, because they are not registered, are recorded in the relevant official areas. Billy especially the Pope and the Dalai Lama belong to that. And I have a bulletin question to answer directly in regard to the Dalai Lama because people simply do not want to understand what is really going on with this bloke and that he is not the peaceful human being which he always pretends, worldwide, to be. Truly, he is certainly not a, holiness, that is to say, a venerable one, rather, he is a, feigned holiness. The reader's question which I shall answer is, why do you abusively insult the Dalai Lama, who is really a peace-loving and good human being? That which you write about him in your bulletins is unbelievable. Asandes, Germany. Patar says lies, bigotry, and slander hold very much more weight for the earth human beings than does the truth. Billy says an article has also appeared in which something is said about that which is really behind the Dalai Lama. So, the talk therein is also that the truth about him is this he pretends to be a worldwide apostle of peace and is followed by millions of faithful who transfer millions in funds to him with which he can carry out and finance his secret work in Tibet. Millions, from which the misogynist can also live very well, whereby it is primarily the woman, of all people, who believe in him, who finance him, as thanks, as it were, that he is ill-disposed towards them, but, because of his fake pious and peace-loving nature, they do not realize it. But his image as an apostle of peace does not correspond to the truth, just as his holiness is also only the mask of his sanctimoniousness. Born Tenzin Jitsu, he was appointed, as a child, to the position of 14th Dalai Lama, respectively to the position of the highest ecclesiastical dignitary and political head of Lamaism. Enthroned from 1935 until 1941, he fled to India after China occupied Tibet in 1959 and ended the bloody goings-on and the serfdom maintained by the Dalai Lama, and the punishments of blinding, flogging, hacking off of limbs and appropriation of the property of Tibetans who had committed punishable offenses. He set up his Indian residence in Dharamsala in the state of Himachal Pradesh. Since the advent of the Tibetan government in exile, he has been the leader whereby, however, this government in exile is not officially acknowledged by any country. Nevertheless, however, many powerful state figures of diverse countries crawl up the Dalai Lama's backside and help him. Officially, the government in exile supports negotiations with the Chinese government in order to obtain real autonomy for Tibet. At the international level, the Dalai Lama sanctimoniously devotes himself to love, peace, freedom and tolerance among the religions and peoples, as well as to the observation of humanity's global responsibility. For that reason he was also awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989. Thereby, However, the fact was completely disregarded probably due to ignorance that, behind his actions and his sanctimonious behavior, he strives for religious and political might and leads a Tibetan resistance movement. This positions itself against the brutal force of the Chinese and has caused great harm since it has been in existence. The members of this underground army call themselves, freedom fighters, whereby, however, in reality, they commit terrorist acts against the Chinese occupiers. The weapons they employ are extremely varied and range from slingshots, 
knives, pistols and rifles, and swords, right up to captured Chinese artillery. Therewith, and by means of their underhandedness, their hate and their thirst for blood and revenge, which they call fearlessness, they taught the Chinese occupiers angst, but they also taught them to raise themselves up, more brutally than ever, against the Tibetans. And all that leads back to the so, peaceful, and, love preaching, Dalai Lama. Truly there is nothing pertaining to the, freedom fighters. Secretly led by the Dalai Lama, which was positioned them passively against the Chinese occupation, because peace readiness is, for them, just as much a sanctimonious farce and, indeed, exactly to the degree maintained by their leader. Yet the simple Tibetans, as well as the exiled Tibetans, and the worldwide believers and followers of the Dalai Lama, know nothing of all that. However, the Chinese Tibetan occupation, for which the whole thing is a military nightmare, knows better. And one can understand this well when one knows that the Tibetan underground army, Kushi Gangdruk, still exists today and carries out its murderous mischief against the Chinese occupation. This underground army, led by Jialo Thondap, a brother of the Dalai Lama, was, namely, never disbanded. Earlier, they were supported by the US American CIA, and indeed for around 25 years. When this was the case, the Dalai Lama also managed to obtain the USA's support for himself and the exiled Tibetan court against China. Thereby, with this Dalai Lama USA connection, armed conflicts were also fought out with the Chinese occupiers by means of USA powers and Tibetan Kushi Gangdruk fighters, whereby it was said of the Tibetan peace fighters that over a long period of time, for every Tibetan killed, ten Chinese had been killed. The Dalai Lama's flight was already prepared in 1951, and indeed with the help of the U.S. American Secret Service's CIA, whereby, at the same time, with their help, great treasures were also already secretly smuggled to India out of the Dalai Lama's main city, Lunyasa primarily gold dust and silver bullion with a current value of around 65 million Swiss francs, respectively about 47.5 million euros. Then, years later, the Dalai Lama's flight took place, well organized by the CIA, which had earlier, in the USA, already trained a small, elite army of, freedom fighters. And indeed in Camp Hale in the Rocky Mountains, which then also accompanied and protected the Dalai Lama as he fled. It comprised around 350 soldiers and 50 freedom fighters. But that was not enough, because the elite fighters had still other tasks to carry out, as, for example, the guerrilla war, but also in that they, as paratroopers, jumped out of smuggled B-17 bombers which bore no national emblems, and led a terrorist form of war against the brutal Chinese occupiers. And so that they could not talk, they were equipped with very fast-acting cyanide poison capsules, which they were required to swallow in the event of being taken prisoner. Yet that was still not enough, because the CIA also pottered about outside of Tibet, as, for example, in the Kingdom of Mustang in Nepal, where a rebel army of more than 12,30s terrorist fighters was set up, which carried out murderous actions against the Chinese occupation in Nepal. And the fact that all the CIA machinations in association with Tibet, has cost the USA hundreds of millions of dollars, is naturally clear, yet even today that is not known by the American people. Also, that the Dalai Lama was paid 186,30 US dollars annually would not be known by the American people. Only in 1972 was the CIA's direct support for the Tibetan resistance suspended, only, however, to be continued by a private although federally organized, financing, as well as by means of the help of ignorant Dalai Lama followers. One can name, for example, the Net National Endowment for Democracy which spent, and still spends, millions of US dollars in order to damage China and to claim that China steers the bloody unrest in Tibet. The Ned claims this contrary to better knowledge, and, self-evidently, contrary to its denial of all its activities in regard to that.
and what the CIA carried out earlier in Tibet is carried out these days in secret by His Feigned Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Patar says you have portrayed the matters correctly, and I think that you can also use that which you have said as an answer for the bulletin question. Billy says good idea. Then I already have one less piece of work. But tell me, is the swine flu finished now or will it continue to exist? Pata says for now, the epidemic is thoroughly over, yet it can always emerge again in the time to come, whereby it must be understood, however, that, in regard to its dangerousness, it is no worse than any other, and, under certain circumstances, no worse than more dangerous influenza epidemics. But the next epidemic already waits in the wings, because in the Benelux countries a new epidemic spreads which has already demanded 1,936 victims. But this fact, however, is partly kept silent but not in order to avoid imprudence, but rather because a certain profiteering calculation is behind it. That was also the case with swine flu in association with which, however, silence was not maintained but, instead, angst and terror were intentionally spread, whereby the pharmaceutical companies earned many millions of US dollars, Swiss francs and euros with antiviral vaccines and medications. The new epidemic concerns so-called goat flu, which also corresponds to an epidemic and is also passed on to human beings of which already far more than 1,3 zeros have succumbed, whereby, there are also some fatalities. Yet this epidemic is also no worse than any other. Billy says I can imagine that the responsible authorities hold their tongues more and keep quiet at this time in order to perhaps, yet again, break in billions. Often very strange paths are taken in order to make horrendous financial profit, Billy says here I have another bulletin question for which I have written the following as an answer, and indeed in accord with your earlier explanations, which I have, in the meantime, also had confirmed by a newspaper article. If you will please listen. Question, did Rasputin really lead a dissolute life as it is portrayed these days? We are convinced that his was not so. J. Boichi, Switzerland. Answer Rasputin did not lead a dissolute life as is attributed to him. This story is malicious slander, however it is true that his murder could barely have been surpassed in terms of its brutality when, in 1916, he was murdered with a .455 Webley pistol by a British agent by the name of Oswald Rayner. Although he was married and had a family, Rasputin was an itinerant monk, that is to say, an itinerant preacher, who, through suggestive influence carried out, miraculous healings, which were truly self-healings of the sick. Thereby he also reached the court of the Tsars, where he had much influence as a friend to the Tsars family, especially because, through a, miracle healing, he had saved the Tsars son from death. That did not please many sectors of the Russian nobility, for which reason they became Rasputin's sworn enemies, sought to take his life and named him, Holy Devil. On the 17th of December, 1916, he was then actually also kidnapped and murdered whereby his murderer was, however, the aforementioned British agent who acted in the commission of the nobles and England. The reason for the murder was Rasputin's political objectives, which endangered the victory of Great Britain in the First World War, which raged at that time. But the murder of Rasputin still had other reasons, because through the nefarious deed the already long planned Russian revolution could also gain ground and be carried out and the Tsar's family could be captured and murdered. Rasputin was the most important advisor to the court of the Russian Tsar's family. As already explained, he was kidnapped on the 17th of December, 1916 whereby the main role was played by a conspirator by the name of Felix Yusufov, who had a friendly relationship with the British agent, Oswald Rayner. Rasputin was dragged into a palace cellar in St. Petersburg, where he was tortured and also poisoned, whereby he was, however, able to counteract the poison, and therefore it did not have the desired effect and he survived the poison attack and was able to flee but he did not get far because a revolver was taken and he was shot two times in the back from behind, which he, however, also survived. 
So the murderer took his weapon again and shot Rasputin in the forehead. Rasputin then died immediately. Therefore, he was first seriously injured by the British agent Oswald Drainer with several shots which, however, Rasputin survived because he simply did not want to die. Only the shot in the forehead really killed him. Consequently, therefore, in this way, a professional execution ultimately occurred. After that, the giant of a man was bound up by the noble conspirators and dragged to the icy Neva River, where they threw him in the icy water. Naturally, the assassins were quickly found, yet the Tsar stopped the police investigation. The conspirators asserted that they had murdered Rasputin because he had exercised too great an influence on the family of the Tsar. These statements from the assassins were, however, not the actual reason why the Tsar did not intervene in the matter of the murder and its investigation, rather it was the fact that it was not a Russian but a foreigner, the British agent, Oswald Rayner, to be exact, who was Rasputin's real murderer. The true reason for the murder was that Rasputin, peace-loving as he was, was active in pressing for an armistice, in order to thereby end the state of war between Russia and Germany and in order, additionally, to also avoid a defeat. And his chances of implementing his desire were, in this regard, very good, because the Tsar, due to Rasputin's enormous influence on the Tsar's family, was willing to bend to Rasputin's wishes and to declare an armistice. But the British, who saw their plans and the victory in the First World War endangered by Rasputin's peaceful political aims, did not like that. Consequently, they introduced into the plan, as murderer, an agent, who worked hand in hand with the conspirators, and whose murder plan fitted theirs exactly, because the nobility were also not keen on an armistice. Had this come about then the entire history of the world would have changed, because, namely, an end to the war with Russia would have enabled Germany to transfer an army of 350,30 soldiers to the Western Front. It would have thereby been possible for the German Kaiser to position his armies against the armies of France, Great Britain and the USA and to overcome them and to be victorious. So, Rasputin's murderer, with his license to kill, committed a cold-blooded murder in the commission of the British Crown, so that, in the First World War, the Allies could obtain victory over the German Empire. Now, my question in regard to that is is the whole thing that I have written here completely right or is there still something else to mention? Patar says there is nothing to add to that which you have read out, because it should suffice and it is also right. There is no need to introduce more explanations about the matter because that which occurred happened around 94 years ago and is no longer relevant. It is not sensible to poke around in old things. The End